Welcome to Pottery Visited, episode 43. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. Today we are diving into chapter 6 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Talons and Tea Leaves. Or, as we like to call it, Doom and Gloom. So this is like our first chapter as we get back into the school swing of things and coming into the Great Hall for breakfast. Malfoy's just, I guess, making fun of Harry and him fainting. Just being an asshole. Generic Malfoy shenanigans. Malfoy is like wants to like just ruin Harry's life. It's just basically his life goal. He's just trying to assert his dominance. I do feel it's like kind of mean to make fun of someone for fainting because he can't help that. And as we discussed the last episode, we have both fainted in public scenarios. Yeah. And it's not it's not fun. It's not ideal, no. Yeah. You don't have control over it and it's it's not it's not a good time. So I mean, Malfoy's not above it. He's not above <laughs> insulting people for like a medical issue or like something like that. He's just a generic asshole. The funny thing is when they're when Fred and George, they sit down Fred and George and Harry's just kind of like reiterating like what happened. George claims that Malfoy came running into their compartment scared when the Dementor came, which makes Harry feel better. And the image of scary Malfoy like w- running into Fred and George is so funny to me. <laughs> In my mind, he like leaps into George's arms and George kind of has to catch him because it's like his instinct. And then he realizes he's holding Malfoy and then he drops him. And then Fred shakes his head because he's real disappointed George got him to begin with. That's how I pictured in my mind. But uh, moving into the times tables, uh, Ron and Harry see Hermione's times table. And it kind of shows like the amount she's taking where she has three classes all at nine o'clock. I think it's Divination, Ancient Ruins, and Arithmancy. And Ron's just kind of like, okay, how, how are you doing this? Because this doesn't make sense. And all she'll say is that she fixed it with Professor McGonagall and everything's fine. Hermione's really lucky that Harry and Ron get easily distracted by other things because that's such a bad lie and she does not cover it up well, but they just have so many other things to think about. They just kind of forget about in her very peculiar time stable. And like Ron's very interested and she just like, and like, I do get it as a friend being like, how are you going to be doing this? This seems kind of crazy. Because he even says like, how can you take 10 subjects a day? That doesn't make any sense. And you're right, Ron, it doesn't make sense. And I still can't believe that no one stopped this or they're letting her do it because it's literally stupid. But Hermione just like very, is very insisted that she doesn't want to talk about it. And she's just like, this is what's happening. McGonagall fixed it for me. And she won't take any questions. Yeah, she could have lied better. She could have just been like, yep, definitely a glitch. I don't think Hermione can't lie. So she's just not, she's just not going to broach the subject because she takes like the comp, like the confidence that they told her about, like not to tell anyone about it very seriously. She wouldn't even tell Harry and Ron. Yeah. Whereas if it was them, they probably would have told Hermione. Oh, for sure. She she knows she can't lie. So she's just very like, like, don't talk to me about it, which works for her. Yeah, I get Because they get distracted easily and forget it's a thing. They're like, wait a minute. Were we trying to remember something? Was there something weird before? Did you remember? Nope. No. Okay. And Ron does get pretty invested in how Hermione does it, but like Hermione won't talk about it. And that's just kind of the end of the everything until she finally opens up about it at the end of the book. But um, I'm wondering how the time turner works for how she gets to her class. It's like, does she ha- have to start the time turner at the beginning of every day? So she's going to all the classes in the morning, all three versions of her. Because I feel like if she went to divination and then went back in time, people from that class would realize well, she's in divination that she wasn't there when she was supposed to be. Yeah. I don't really get how time travel works. Yeah. I mean... As long as she doesn't run into herself, it's fine. That's the rule, right? So, like, if there was a student in her divination class that had to go to the bathroom and, like, walked by the classroom for ancient runes and looked inside and saw Hermione, they'd probably be like, what the hell? She was just in the other classroom and now she's in this one. Like, that would be weird. But I think it works out because they're probably three different classrooms and three different, like, hallways, yeah, we know the North Tower is like like one end of the school. I figured she does it like she wakes up in the morning and she does her one of her first classes. And then when it's over, she goes into the hallway and she or a closet, I guess, and rewinds to the beginning of the class and then goes to the second morning class and then rewinds again. And like she knows the other versions of her are in the other two classes. So she doesn't go there. She goes to her third class and then she probably only eats lunch once and then does her like first after lunch course and then rewinds and does her other first after lunch course. And like, it seems like a lot to keep track of just schedule wise. Like, I feel like I would accidentally miss a few classes. Yeah, honestly, just the, just the first thing 
nine in the morning. She has three classes that she has to go back in time for. And it seems so crazy. But and just for her, like eating even like I was saying, she probably doesn't do lunch three times just because she's three classes before. But maybe she like she's been awake for like say each class is three hours. Everyone else has been awake for three hours and is going to start their second class. She's been awake for nine. Yeah, that's insanity. And done three classes. Like it's she would be so tired. And also like what about death? Like people have a certain amount of lifespan and like cellular regeneration at some point stops being faster than your rate of cell death. So like will she die faster than everyone else because she's technically been living for more like hours and days? Like short term it's probably fine, but like long term use of time turners to me would lead to like dying young because you've technically been living more days than your age. This is why I don't like time travel stuff. It gets too confusing and there's just so many different ways it can go. Like, is it all linear or is there different dimensions and different timelines? And it's all, it's just too much and I don't feel it's done well. But in general, I don't think time traveling is done very well. Unless it's the entire point of the show. Things like Doctor Who where I'm like, okay, the point of the show is time travel. That's fine. But like, there's so many other things going on in Harry Potter and they're like, time travel. And I'm like, and they clearly regret it later on. Like the author tries to like, oh, all the time turners got destroyed. Like she's like, oops, look at all the fallacies I've created and look at all the like. Yeah, there's just so many plot holes. This is a plot hole that I cannot fill. So I'm going to be like, oops, they're gone forever. It's yeah, we, we don't talk about the time turners. Yeah, I just I'll talk about it later when we get more into how the time turners use. But I just think it just opens too many plot holes and it doesn't make sense to me. What if you do something altering to yourself in one of your time? Like, what if she skipped ancient runes, just went to the other two classes and got a tattoo? Would she have that tattoo, even though part of her never went to ancient? I don't know, man. Yeah, see, that's like the thing. But is it a linear timeline where it'll affect her timeline? Or is it she just in constant alternate timelines? It's exhausting. But moving on from Hermione and her time turner woes, we have the trio going to divination together and they stumble upon Sir Cardogan. Cadogan? Cadogan. It's it's open for, I like, I think Cadogan sounds fancy, which makes me think it's probably Cadogan. I just, I feel like it's very old timey, like medieval, because he is a medieval knight. Cadogan, maybe. Either way, he's amazing. He's a delight. An absolute goofy, ridiculous delight. It's fun that they like give personalities to the art. I think it's fun. But uh, I love that he at first is like trying to challenge them to a duel. And then when they mention that they're trying to get somewhere, he's like, ah, a quest. And leads them like through their portraits there. That's so fun. He's just like red archetypes, archetypes of what knights are like, I guess. And he's like, knights, get in fights. So he's like kind of trying to pick a fight. But he also knows that knights like quests. So if there's an opportunity for a quest, he's like, oh, I'll do that knightly thing. He's just like looking for opportunities to behave in a way that he thinks real knights would behave. Yes, yeah, so the divination classroom is like up on the north tower and like up like a trap ladder. So I guess it's kind of like, in, like in the attic of the tower. And I know that Harry and Ron don't like divination, but when they describe the room, it just sounds like my vibe. Just like cushy chairs, bunch of teapots. I know. All fire and cozy. And I'm like, I wouldn't really like the perfume aspect because I'm pretty sensitive to scents, but just everything about it seems just my vibe, right? Just like curl up in a cozy chair with, it's all like warm and toasty, bunch of tea. I, specifically in your notes, you wrote, this room is my cup of tea, which given that they're reading tea leaves, gorgeous, brilliant. That was intentional. I also love the room. It feels like how I want my room to be when I'm reading a book. Like it feels like the cozy dim lighting, like depending on the scent, like I have some scented candles I like. So if I imagine the perfume being a scent I like. The only reason I say I didn't like it was because Harry describes it as being too overwhelming and like a scented candle I can do, but anything that's too much too much scent is a bit, a bit much for me because he says it makes him feel drowsy and sleepy and i'm like oh, i don't really like that feeling but and it's really like it sounds the most comfortable like it feels like everywhere else you sit in like wooden chairs no and like at a desk yeah like a typical like desk situation and i kind of like the vibe of like floofs and cushy chairs and like i've googled shints chair because they say they're in shints chairs and they're just like big tackily patterned armchairs that look really comfortable yeah apparently it's like a type of fabric or pattern and it's just like very for all my like grandma's house in like the best way possible yeah that's kind of how i see the entire classroom grandma decor style dark but like 
comfortable and like very textile in like soft materials and fabrics and like we're basically just adding the fact that we are just want to be grandmas <laughs> we are so old oh my goodness it's such a it's a, such a good vibe i would want all my classrooms to be like that i'd want like my common room to be like that like it's just cozy I might fall asleep. I might get drowsy. But also, I think they want you to be a little drowsy because your eye will open up more, you know? You're... Yeah, apparently it's supposed to help you um, unlock your inner eye. I mean, I guess if I'm really sleepy, I'm more prone to, like, dreaming and or, I guess, hallucinating. And I guess that's, like, the type of, like, open to the energies of the world. Yeah, maybe it's supposed to, like, open up your subconscious or something. Yeah, I, I can see what she's going. I also kind of low-key wonder if she's, like putting some hallucinogens in the air like put it like like it says they say that it says the fire smells kind of weird and i'm like i wonder if she has some kind of like i don't want to say she's drugging them but something she's using to assist in the opening up of their like um susceptibility to suggestion and some kind of herb blend. visual <laughs> hallucinations i don't know i'm just saying it could be that she's drugging them the tea could be they don't say the tea is not shrooms tea they don't say it <laughs> they just say it's very hot and strong because we have the opening to professor trelawney who is quite a character on her own right and kind of crazy kooky lady and when she's uh doing the, her opening demonstration to what, what divination is she just mentioned that books won't be like helping you this is something you kind of either have or you don't and i'm wondering if this is the moment where her money's like you know what this is this is kooky like this is stupid like this isn't real magic because her mind is based in logic and she's like if it's like impractical or uh, like indecisive or like not accurate all the time it's not like real to her it kind of feels like something where like a certain amount of the books help because like if you look at a symbol on a cup it looks like a symbol and you can look at the book and like match it and know what it means but it also kind of feels like you do kind of need a gift. Like it feels like not everyone will be born with a gift and some people might discover they have the gift in divination class and some people might just enjoy like tea leaf readings and things like that that are probably more possible for anyone. But I understand that like not everyone's going to be able to see the future. It's not normal for all wizards. So like I get it kind of. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because like it is like a very like inaccurate or kind of like you can't really measure it it's not like like a math class or a science class where things are pretty like they happen this way and it's all based on like logic where it's it's more of like an artsy kind of class where like you either have like raw talent or you don't and obviously you can learn things like all the different symbols and i'm sure like it's like you can learn the theory you can't necessarily learn the practical if you don't have that skill so like you can learn to write an essay and say if you see a dog in your cup, it's the grim and you're probably going to die. But if you see the sun, it means like happiness. But if you were to see both, it means you're going to be very at peace with the thought of your death. I don't know. Like you can write essays on it and you can do readings on it, but you certainly doesn't mean you're going to do good predictions in the practical exam. Exactly. And Hermione, oh, that, that doesn't go with her. Like she... It's not her vibe. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not who she is. And also Trelawney only in her demonstration predicts bad things yeah there's no like oh your family's going to prosper financially this year there's no like you're going to have your first love this year it's going to be fun for you like there's none of that it's just like doom gloom bad news i feel like she loves the drama of it because good things are just like it's like it's nice but it, it's not, it doesn't have like the dramatic effect and i feel like she wants people to like really like be like in awe of her and like all this crazy stuff so she's just very dramatic from what we get from McGonagall later like, that she does like the same thing every year but yeah she only says bad things because that gets people talking that gets people like, interested it, and she's kind of a Debbie Downer as a character anyway like she only ever sees the bad side of things she never sees the good side of things yeah she kind of opens up the class where she just she's giving her spiel about donation and then she'll call out certain people and she tells Neville that his grandma might not be well and then that's his only living guardian and Neville's a pretty anxious kid I'm just like poor Neville <laughs> I mean, his parents are alive. It's his only, like... Well, that's, like, his guardian, like, living guardian that can actually take care of him. Yeah. It's his only family that can emotionally support him right now. But I also noticed that, like, there are a lot of theories that Trelawney is always right in her predictions, actually. And so I think it'd be interesting to keep track of all of the things she says and see how they could possibly be right. So, like, some people have said the example of, like, her seeing Neville's grandmother as unwell is that she's actually seeing a vision of when the Bogart of Snape is dressed up as Neville's grandma. Ooh. And then, like, obviously you have what you think the Pavardi prediction is about the redheaded man. Yeah, so I it 
So it's boy or a redheaded man. And I just think that in book six, uh, Ron and Lavender date, and it's this whole crazy thing. And it's it's kind of ill-fated and a disaster and both. Well, it's to Pavardi. Yeah, though. but Pavardi's Lavender's friend. I We get the vibe that she doesn't really like Ron and Lavender together. Like they're, they're like a lot. Like we know Harry didn't really like Lavender either, but they, they're just kind of friends. Like it's like when your friend dates or they're just like, they date this person they're obsessed with and you're just like not about it. I just feel like Pavardi didn't have a fun time with that relationship. I more so thought it was that Pavardi ends up being Ron's date to the Yule Ball in the fourth book, and it's a bad time. That's her sister. Oh, so Pav- Pavardi goes with Harry and Padma goes... Yeah. Okay, well, maybe Trelawney saw her sister having a bad time because they're identical twins, because they're identical. So maybe that's what she saw. But then also, like, the flu in February is pretty likely because it's the winter. Um, so she predicts the flu in February and she predicts one of the students leaving forever and Hermione does quit the course and never take divination again. So it could be Hermione. They mentioned that happening around Easter. So we should keep track of like what month they say it is when that happens to see if that checks out. Um, there's also, she predicts Neville breaking the cup, which we know happens immediately, but that again is probably feels like it could easily be parlor tricks. Like you suggest something to someone who's already a nervous, shaky person, they're likely to do it. But it does happen. And she also predicts Neville being late to the next class, which is also could just be having observed his personality. But we know he probably is late to the next class because that I can confidently say that's likely. So, I mean, so far, it's looking like technically all of her predictions could have been correct. There's also the one about um, something that she's dreading. So I know that it's because we find out that her rabbit died, but she finds the news out on the 16th of October and it doesn't actually happen then. And then Hermione has this whole thing. We'll talk about it later, but like about like how it's like, why were you be dreading it if you, if you didn't know it was going to happen? Yeah, she didn't know her rabbit was sick, so she wasn't dreading it dying. My theory is that that's also the day that Sirius Black almost breaks into Hogwarts or does break into Hogwarts. And so maybe the thing she was actually dreading that everyone is dreading is Sirius Black breaking and like the escaped serial killer breaking into Hogwarts is probably something all of the students are a little bit afraid of. So I feel like that could be what that's predicting. Honestly, like your note says Harry in general danger. It's always in general danger. <laughs> oh yeah, she's always she's like Harry. I see death, and also you have an enemy, and also pain in your future. And I'm like, I mean, it's correct, but it's like it's like telling a Leafs fan there's going to be suffering in their future. You know what I'm saying? So uh, when Ron and Harry are reading to those tea leaves, um, Harry reads that Ron's going to suffer but be happy. He's going to be happy eventually. So I'm wondering what this can mean for Ron's future, as we know he does suffer quite a few times throughout the yeah book. people he loves dies he goes through a lot of miserable crap he has a really ugly suit he has to wear to a school dance that's embarrassing <laughs> i definitely think i mean everyone suffers in life because life is pain but also Bron lives happily you know he goes on adventures with his friends he falls in love reading into more he says happy and i think that's just like content with yourself as well because we know ron's very insecure it's one of his like traits throughout the book especially like the main series he's just a very insecure person and just knowing that like after all the insecurities and everything you've been through and like you're gonna be happy and just like happy with yourself as well which Ron is like he he really comes into himself by the end of the series and in the epilogue he seems very content with his family with his life and just good things coming for Ron yeah and he does he does suffer so I mean I Harry's killing it right now in Divination. I feel like that, again, is one of those vague ones, though. Like, I could tell you you're going to suffer, but it's going to turn out okay. And unless you perish horribly, I'm probably right. Don't do that, by the way, especially before Brittany's wedding. You can't perish horribly before Brittany's wedding. I'll stick around for the wedding. So during this conversation around Harry's cup, where Trelawney sees the Grimm, Hermione starts talking back to Trelawney. And it's so crazy because we've never seen her talk to a teacher like this. It's crazy, too, because it's so quick. Like, she's just met Trelawney. Like, it's a, it's not like she's had her for a few weeks. And, like, the teacher hasn't really addressed her. She hasn't. She doesn't know how she marks. She doesn't know, like, how fair her grading schematic is or, like, how good she is at actually teaching much. She doesn't know much about her at all. And she's just like, actually, I don't think that's that. And mm, 
are you sure? Like, she's so contradictory and, like... It doesn't look like that to me. Yeah, really, really quick. Almost combative in a way. Yeah, even, like, Ron and Harry are surprised because, like, like Harry never talks like that to a teacher. And it just kind of shows, like, how dismissive she is about divination as a subject. And really quick, too. I was also wondering if it could be the time turner because if this is, like, her third class she's taken. She's probably exhausted. I just think that maybe, like, she's really quick to jump to, like, anger because, like, she's already been out for six hours. And obviously this isn't, like, the class that she likes she obviously isn't really drawn to this class. She can tell already that it's not really going to be a class for her. So she's already kind of already like just really quick to jump to um, I guess anger or just frustrated. Yeah, I could just see her being overtired. She's tired. She, yeah, she's really got a few. She's on like her last wit's end. She's probably hasn't had lunch yet, but she's been awake for hours. She's hungry. She's sleepy. It's really cozy in there. And she just has no energy left probably to put up with dumb things. And, like, to me, ancient runes and uh, arithmancy sound like some of the more specific, like, very Hermione, cut and dry, right and wrong, the answer is this, it's not open for debate type of subjects. So I kind of feel like to go from things that are, like, peak Hermione's favorite styles of learning to this, she's like, no. Like, I'm so excited about all my new courses that I get to take now. Everything's great. Oh, wait, what is this? Oh, no. Like, it's such a... Like when you eat your favorite meal and then someone brings out like Brussels sprouts and you're like, no, I'm done. No, no, no. I, I'm full. I'm done. <laughs> Opt out. I think about like if each class is like an hour, she's already been up for like three hours and she could, probably is hungry. Yeah, and I think they're longer than an hour. I feel like it's either four or six classes a day generally. I mean, that also, I guess it's different if you have like an evening class, like astronomy, where you have to be in a different time slot. But yeah, I could just see her being a bit grouchy because she's hungry and, and- doesn't enjoy this class already she's she's run out of like energy to put up with and tolerate shenanigans she's like you know what yeah but it's just so interesting that it, when Hermione doesn't doesn't value something the way she's very like disdainful towards it like she doesn't like divination so she's like I'm just gonna ruin this class and be mean to the teacher for no reason I mean she wasn't mean she was just contradicting which I think yeah. is fair because Trelawney isn't you it doesn't necessarily instill confidence in her prediction abilities the way she goes about it yeah it feels more like a production like a play almost the way she goes on about things yeah I think it's exhausting I feel like Trelawney is very dramatic intentionally like she likes to present and put on a show you know and Hermione's just like wants to like fast forward and probably can actually fast forward through all the like introduction and all the like blah 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 she's like why is there so much fluff just give me the course content so I can start taking notes on it and studying it stop you're not going to quiz us on what teacups Neville should be using so don't tell me this information it's not important so we find out that the grim that Trelawney sees in Harry's cup is the death omen. And Harry seems kind of like worried about this. I think it's also Ron's just, oh, so this is a big deal. Ron's making it a big deal as well as the rest of the class. But I'm like, should Harry really be surprised? I mean, he ha- literally has like, since he's been born, almost murdered like four, four times. A serial killer broke out of Aspen to come and kill him, or so he thinks. Like, I feel like he shouldn't be that surprised that he has a death omen in his cup. I mean, people have been trying to kill him. It couldn't even, it might not even be a warning that he's going to die. It could be a warning that he's already almost died. Like, it doesn't necessarily, it's not like a necess. it doesn't definitely mean you're about to die. It could also just mean you're going to die, which is a fact, you know? We're all going to die. I think Harry is still susceptible to, like, peer pressure. And he, ha- he has, like, a teacher telling him, he's like, oh, there's death though when you're going to die. And all the- his classmates and Ron are being like, oh, my God, this is so serious. Ooh, Harry's going to die. <laughs> and then like, the fact that it's a dog and he's like, oh, I saw a dog. <laughs> he- it turns out to be serious. But he's like, oh, I saw that dog. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. I mean, it's sort of how actual, like, people who, like, I-, I don't know how I feel about real psychics. There probably are some out there in the world. But, like, people who are pretending tending to be psychic for money do similar things where they like think of something you're likely to have seen and like tell you that it had more meaning and then you're like wait I saw that yeah like most people see a dog once in a while 
it's not the rarest of sights. I just find that funny because he was so nonchalant when Mr. Reese is like, Sirius Black escaped to come and kill you. He's like, oh, whatever. Voldemort's already trying to kill me. So what's one more? But here he's like, oh my God, I saw a death omen. I mean, maybe it's because it's vague, right? Because when someone says Sirius Black, notorious serial killer, escaped from Azkaban is coming to get you. You're like, okay, I know what he looks like. It's going to be like hand-to-hand combat or like magic face-to-face. I'm good at that. I've beat Voldemort before. I've got this. But when she's just like, yeah, you're going to die. He's like, is it Sirius Black coming to kill me? Am I going to fall down the stairs and break my neck? Is it a disease? Am I getting bitten by a poisonous bug? Like, when it's that vague, everything becomes threatening, kind of. Yeah. So they move on from their crazy divination lesson to um, McGonagall's transfiguration lesson. And they're all very subdued. And she, McGonagall's kind of like, what, what the hell's going on here? Who died? And they're like, no one yet, but it's going to be Harry. <laughs> so McGonagall's like, t- talking to them about uh, Anna Magi, and she transforms in front of them. And she's like, every year I get an applause. What the hell, guys? Appreciate my good magic. I think it's interesting that she's teaching them about Anna Magi. First of all, because we know it's a very advanced magic. Most people can never become Anna Magi. And they're also just, like, third years. So, like, it's not like she's going to teach them to become anime guy. I'm wondering if it's, like, a teaser. Like, when teachers tell you a really interesting thing that you can one day learn if you get really good at what they're showing you to make the, like, less interesting stuff you're going to learn right now seem like it's just, like, a gateway to cooler things. Because, like, maybe you don't want to turn a teapot into a, a rabbit. That's not your style. But, like, you could turn yourself into a rabbit one day. That would be awesome. So it's kind of like a, a fun teaser. Yeah, I think that they're going to start learning about more, like, smaller things. Like, I know they do some human transformation in school. Like, that, that's, like, the full circle of, like, turning yourself into something else. But I know, like, in book six, they're, like, giving each other, like, facial hair and, like, changing, like, the color of their hair and stuff. So I'm assuming that they're going to start learning more about, like, doing, like, bigger things in Transfiguration. And that's kind of what she's showing them, like, like this is how, this is something that you can be doing. It's just funny because, like, obviously they mention it because it's a, it's a, like, a teaser for the fact yeah, that we're going to learn about them later and it's very important in this novel. But it's just funny because it's very advanced to, like, be bringing up. And they also don't seem to care at all. They're so busy being like, Harry's going to die. They're not even like, but also a cat. I feel like you would pay more attention to the cat than Harry dying. (laughs) Whatever, Harry. You're not important. (laughs) You'd be giving a standing ovation. Well done, Minnie. Amazing. Minnie G. (laughs) (laughs) Love Minnie G. She also, when once Ryan tells her like why they're all stressed out, McGonagall is like really funny because she obviously has no patience for Trevani or divination in general. And she lets them know that in like a very, um, I would say it professional way. And she's like, I never talk bad about my colleagues, but, <laughs> and so like, divination's a very imprecise bit of magic. And like, and seers are very rare. <laughs> she's just spelling it out for them. I also really like the vibe she has when she talks about it. Like she isn't like, Harry, or listen kids, I want you to know that just like she, cause that would make it seem scary still. She was very much like, ah, okay, lighthearted, kind of like rolling her eyes. Ah, who's dying this year? And like having someone, something you're concerned about be taken sort of casually, not in like a gaslighting way, but in like a, oh, if they're not taking it that seriously, maybe it's not that serious way. And it really like sets the tone for how the discussion's going to go. And it really, I think, I find it the perfect way to do it. Like it definitely would relieve me. And McConnell's a seasoned teacher. She knows how to kind of like handle like, Stuff like this, especially if she's like what she says, Trillian does this every year. So she's probably very used to it for being like, oh, this again, who's dying? And then she tells Harry like, oh, if you die, you don't need to hand in your homework. (laughs) And it's just a really great way to diffuse the tension. And most people are kind of like, oh yeah, she said every year, okay, whatever. Ron's still freaked out. Hermione's like, McGonagall said it, so it's true. Yeah, she would never lie unless Dumbledore explicitly told her to. I do wonder, like, if she does this every year, like, what other students she said were going to die. Because I could imagine, like, if she said Fred or George were going to die. Oh, my God. Well, 100% she said it to one of the Weasley twins because they're annoying and she wants to frighten them into behaving. And because we think maybe her predictions are correct, you know she said it to Fred. 
So I think they would have handled it really funny though, being like, if one of them's gonna die, and they're just gonna be like, ah. he's like, are you sure it's me? I look just like this guy. Are you sure it's not him? Yeah, yeah. And I think friend George for sure because I could see her trying yeah. to like tone down their energy yeah. by ooh scary news. And it just not working mm-hmm. on them because they're like me. Yeah. So when they kind of leave after for lunch, Hermione's already talking about like how about basically dropping divination as a subject. She's saying it wasn't interesting. It's like it's very woolly. It's not really believable. It's imprecise. And she's like, my other classes were much better. And she's already talking about dropping it. So why didn't she drop it? She made a commitment. You know what I mean? I feel like she's. Like, oh, I committed to taking this class. But also, like, if she drops one, she might worry that, like, McGonagall and Dumbledore will see that and think it's too much for her and take away the time turner altogether. And she wants to keep her time traveling other courses. She just doesn't want this one. Yeah, that's true. Would have to bring that up and discuss it with them in a way that expresses that it's not a time travel's hard issue. It's a divination's dumb issue. (laughs) McGonagall would understand, but Dumbledore is kind of an asshole, so. It's definitely reasonable for, like, with you take... you elect to take a class, but you don't really know much about it. And then you kind of like to have the first two or three lessons where it kind of goes over what you're going to be doing. And if you don't think that you like it, just drop it. Because I, in high school, I kept up with a class that I did not like, but I was too, like, I don't know, anxious or whatever to go through with changing classes or changing my schedule because it felt like it was already set in stone. And I suffered through that class the whole year and it was terrible. Yeah, I definitely had a couple classes that I dropped. The truth is, if you don't think you're going to like a class... You should just, there's no harm in like leaving it because. Unless it's a core course for your degree or it's a, like a a prerequisite. Yeah. Yeah. But generally if you don't like something, there's no harm in just going for something else. I wish I did that in high school. Anyway, uh, Ron kind of has a go at Hermione where she's just kind of like being like really dismissive of the Grimm where he's still kind of on it because, you know, his uncle Billy has died from the Grimm. And then he kind of calls her out for not liking divination because Trani said that she was didn't have the gift. And you just don't like it because you're not good at it. Bit of feuding, bit of tension. But also, I wonder, like, because I can see how, like, Hermione. It sounds like baloney to be like this symbol represents death, and if you see it. But I can also see how, like, divination to some extent has to be taken seriously in the wizarding world because it's still a real valid course. So, like, I'm thinking people who have more magical families probably have relatives or friends of the family in the magical world who have had experiences with divination that were like Ron where like oh I this thing was proven correct in this situation or like oh no I know someone who studied it for years and was good at it or like this is the accuracy like she doesn't have any personal experience of divination or any like secondhand story from someone she trusts about it so it's wishy-washy especially since like in the muggle world psychics are they're seen as fakes and like phonies and like scammers and so to her it's just like oh but even though it, it magic is real like this isn't really magic like yeah she's like this is like the close-up magic for like circuses class at the wizarding school <laughs> um yeah she doesn't take it seriously but i think if she'd known someone who'd had an experience with it it would be easier for her to take it seriously be like oh, okay this person who i know and trust and she does change her mind when they find out that there's real prophecies and it is real she is, doesn't really believe uh Trelawney. i mean Trelawney almost is like she lives she like lives the stereotype of what you would think a psychic or a divination teacher would be and i think hermione's like if you really are that you don't need to lean into the stereotype so hard you don't need to dress like that you don't need to wear the shawls like you don't need to pretend to be Stevie Nicks to convince us you can see the future, you know? I mean, we all want to pretend to be Stevie Nicks, but it's like, <laughs> it's. I just feel like Chelani is putting on the costume of the role she actually has, and it makes it so much less believable. I just feel like it's the way she teaches, too. Like, she is kind of, like, excluding almost being like, some of you will have the gift, but some won't. Also, I mean, I know Hermione excels at theory more than in practice, generally, but they didn't give them any theory. Like, they're like, okay, here's teacups. Like, the textbook tells you what the symbol in the cup means. But, like, I almost agree with Hermione in that I would have liked half the class or the first 15 minutes to have been like, okay, this is a brief history of tasimony and using tea leaves to predict the future. And here are some like historical evidence where it's been used in known documented instances where proper interpretation has assisted in political choices or health choice or whatever. Here's a couple examples in real life. And we'll take some notes on like some of the key people and what they did and like how it's evolved as a science. Like to me, there should be 
It shouldn't just be like, okay, here's a teacup. I'm sure if there was a proper teacher, they would have done that. But Shulani is just definitely more in for the showmanship of it. But I think that could pertain to a lot of why her mind doesn't like it is that I also would have wanted a bit of like background on it and information before I'm just thrown into the thing. It definitely shows that it depends on the teacher because yeah, Shulani is more of like a showman's kind of thing where she wants to perform and kind of go into all the and do everything where I feel like if Hermione had like a teacher that would do do a bit more theory and then practical she probably would have maybe not as hated divination as much. I think I could teach divination quite well actually and generally I don't think I'd be a good teacher but divination is the right amount of like an art that I could be cute and artsy and the right amount of like history and interpretation like I like the and I couldn't teach children because I don't do that i don't be around children they're not my favorite but i could see like it being a fun course to teach we should do a tea leaf reading at some point i just want an excuse to drink tea always always with the tea drinking after lunch they move on to their next class which is with hagrid and it is a shit show yeah so hagrid kind of starts the lesson off and he's just you can already kind of see that he doesn't really have control of the class like he's instructing him how to open the books and like, they're all calling out to him and Malfoy's just like being really like rude to him and he's not really doing anything and he's kind of double checking a Hermione or like Harry or Ron being like he's like oh I thought this would be fun or and he's it's he doesn't have control and it's just it's very apparent like he isn't really teaching them he's just kind of like showing them stuff and he's always double checking with Hermione as well and I'm like you're an adult this, this is your job you should be like have some essence yeah, I understand when you're doing something new, wanting to look to other people for like encouragement and reinforcement that what you're saying is correct. And like once in a while to look at them and see like if you tell a joke and see if they're laughing or to like see if they look interested. But he's like checking too frequently, I think, which makes me think that he didn't really prepare what he's saying or like consider his audience at all. He was just like, I can't wait to talk about hippogriffs. But like you have to like kind of lesson plan, like being a teacher is a very hard job. And they, these kids are 13. Like, they can pick up on that. Also, he's probably drunk. Like, there's a good possibility he's drunk. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I hope not. Have a little shot before class to get the guy drunk. <laughs> but like, a Hagrid-sized shot is like a pint of oh liquor. <laughs> like, he, he's a half giant. So they have the hippogriff class. And Hagrid actually does a really good job of introducing the hippogriff and showing them everything and allowing like the students to get up close and showing them like all the important bits and everything but i think harry flying the hippogriff was a bit much way <laughs> too much way it's like going to driver's ed and the teacher's like this is a car see these these are brakes this is a wheel okay now get on the 401 good luck bud i, like, I feel like that kind of happened to me when i took a charter lessons a million years ago but like first lesson first day like it's just it's too like patting them is cool but also if you have dangerous animals and like that many kids, it doesn't seem like they should all be looking at a different hippogriff at the same time when Hagrid is the only supervisor. Like it kind of seems like he should like have a hippogriff, invite a group of five people over, each of them one by one introduces themselves, and then he they get to pet the hippogriff and then he brings over the next group. Of, so he has like a manageable amount of students interacting with a potentially dangerous animal at once. And he can keep an eye on that amount. If there's different hippogriffs with various groups of students around each one, he really can't supervise properly for an animal that could be dangerous. Like it's just. I do feel like he puts a lot of effort in making the classes fun and making sure everyone's like enjoying themselves rather than actually instructing or actually like yeah. looking after like the student's well being, like, what if Harry had fallen off the hippogriff? Like, there's all these things he doesn't think about. But all he thinks about is like, oh, getting Harry to fly this hippogriff would be so fun. Everyone would think it was so cool. He's not thinking about like the actual lesson and like the learning and like the safety aspects. There's, I just think it's the whole thing is very negligent. And the people like, I, Hagrid loves animals and he wants to have a job that makes him feel good about himself. And I get all those things. But like, if you're gonna give Hagrid this job, Dumbledore, you know what Hagrid is like. And you have to like, have him submit a list of what animals he's introducing the students to and you have to like tell him what he can and can't have students do with that animal like hippogriffs are dangerous 
Do not let someone fly them. Yeah, Hagrid could literally pull out a dragon and be like, hey, we're studying a dragon today. And Dumbledore would be like, oh, cool. Like nothing poisonous for the third years. You know what I mean? Fifth year and up, you can give them poisonous animals once they've learned how to engage with ones that aren't as dangerous. Yeah, I don't think Dumbledore looks into any of the curriculums because they do they do the screw it's next year. And I don't think Dumbledore knew anything about that. <laughs> no, I know. It's, it's nice that he's passionate about what he's doing. And it's nice that Hagrid wants the kids to have fun. That's nice. But... Safety does need to be a concern. And actually learning needs to be a concern. And you need to expect a couple teenagers are going to do the opposite of what you tell them. Knowing that, bringing an animal that is offended easily maybe isn't the smartest choice. Yeah, these are like middle school children. Like, yeah. Like all the things that we did in middle school. Like that was, shouldn't have been an option. I just, yeah, it just seems like Hagrid doesn't understand. I mean, I guess when you're young, like he has, he acts very young for his age. And I guess you have to reach a certain age to understand that you have to present yourself slightly differently with different audiences. And that's how we know that like our I'm chatting with my boss version of ourselves is different than I'm having sangria on the porch with my friends version of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, he's, he talks to Harry Ron Hermione like he would in normal circumstances and not like a teacher during class time. But even like, even teachers, like I'm friends with a couple people who are teachers. And like when I hang out with them, they're fun, they're chill, they're laid back. They tell jokes that are inappropriate. Like they're fantastic and wonderful people, but they would never behave that way in front of their students yeah. because they're like, they know that like that's a different audience. And like even people I know who are like college professors so like there's their students are their age or around their age like it's not there's not a huge age gap they're adults they're teaching not kids you still act a little differently with those kids than you would someone you meet in the staff room or in a cafe because like the role that's on you like you're a bit of an authority figure you're supposed to be there to support and help them you're teaching them like it's just like the way you appropriately engage in conversation with people is different based on the role you have in their lives and Hagrid just doesn't get that like he's the same person with everyone and it's kind of super inappropriate I think and so you get into the fact that like Hagrid has kind of all this stuff going on at the same time and he's not really paying close attention to what everyone's doing and of course Malfoy who wasn't listening kind of insults Buckbeak and then he gets I don't know like hit pecked stabbed who knows bit is it pecked is it bit does he have teeth does Buckbeak have teeth I don't know if he has teeth but then he also has the cloth like the talons so either way Mopoy gets hurt and he's screaming withering in pain and Hagrid's kind of like freaked out he doesn't know what to do so Hermione's like kind of telling him like oh you need to go do this and he's like he's just very it seems he he's very like not aware of what he should be doing and Hermione is just kind of filling in that adult role for him but the thing is like, Hagrid is the adult he should be doing this he's supposed to be yeah she is a 13 year old who's tired she's been awake for hours we get end the chapter off where the trio go to go see Hagrid after hours to find out what happened and we kind of get the idea that Malfoy is kind of aching on his um injury yeah he's playing it up for sure to get sympathy and to get Hagrid fired and whatever. And Hagrid's very upset, thinking he's going to be sacked, and he's drinking his pint of whatever. Of mead? A tankard of mead? Yeah, so he's basically drunk. And Hermione is just kind of like, you need to stop drinking. Like, and I'm just like, Hagrid, you're, you're the adult. You, should, you shouldn't really be having 13-year-olds take care of you while you're drunk. Inappropriate. And also, like... You got in trouble for doing something or having something happen under your watch that could be viewed as you being negligent. And then your response is like daytime drinking. That's also negligent. Like what if Dumbledore came to talk to him about the incident and he's just like drunk. I'm like, this is the opposite of convincing them that you deserve a second chance or you should have more opportunities or you've learned from your mistake. You're like, I'll just get drunk in the afternoon before my next classes, probably. No, I think this is in the evening. Oh. They haven't heard for anything. So I think it's in the e So he's not day drinking, but he's still like, you know, drinking and like not really. Yeah. I mean, it's different in the evening, I guess, then, because they, he didn't know they were coming in the evening. He's like, I'm just getting, you know, I'm having a flagger of mead in the evening, like one does after a hard day. Of well, he's still definitely doing like, he's definitely confiding in them. And, and I just think it's a bit much for Hermione to kind of be like, taking care of him when he should kind of be like if they came over and like okay i'm gonna pull this pity party and get get out of it and take care of these kids yeah like you could he only kind of snaps out of it once he kind of like sobers up a bit and he's like wait a minute harry you shouldn't be here and then he goes all authoritative on them 
But I'm like, Hermione literally like took your drink away from you like five seconds ago. You don't get to play it being the grown up right now. You're not being the grown up right now. Hermione is the grown up. We love Hagrid, but he's definitely just very stunted. And I think this was a bit too much responsibility for him. He's a really nice guy. But yeah, I think it comes down to like, there's a certain Gryffindor thing where Gryffindor is being Gryffindor is value loyalty above a lot of other things that also have value. And because Hagrid is the most unquestionably loyal character in the entire novel, it gives him this golden glow in the eyes of a lot of people, specifically Gryffindors, where like, because he's so loyal, they see him through these rose colored glasses and they forget that there are other areas where he is not as strong and I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I feel like Harry, Harry, it's through Harry's point of view, and Harry definitely has rose-tinted glasses when it comes to Hagrid because of everything Hagrid's done for him. But we do see that Hermione is able to, like, love Hagrid as the friend he is, but she's also, like, he's she also can't admit that he's not a good teacher, but she can't really say that in front of Harry because he gets super mad because to Harry, it's like, Hagrid is all or nothing. Because he, he's collecting substitute father figures, and Hagrid is one of them. yeah. Hagrid's all or nothing. Like, he can't be bad at anything. Hagrid is everything or nothing. It does say a lot about Hermione's maturity, because it is younger kids that see everything as good and evil, and until Dumbledore explains to them shades of grey. But Hermione's already there. She's like, Hagrid is not a bad person. He is a good person. He just isn't the most responsible. Yeah, and like Ron and Harry see that as an attack on his character. They're like, he is the most responsible, smartest, safety conscientious person you'll ever meet, damn it, Hermione. With all this blasphemy. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited. Yeah, we'll be back next time to discuss Chapter 7, The Bogart in the Wardrobe, for some great Lupin and Snape content. Yeah, and if you have any thoughts about today's episode, you can reach us at Potter Revisited on social media or Potter Revisited Podcast at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.